What's up, Beijing? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's Up Beijing, a segment called What's Up Beijing, where we analyze what's going on in the world's second largest economy and one of the most important geopolitical actors in the world, China. All about what's going on in China, which is currently experiencing probably the most negative economic news it's ever faced. But before I tell you this news, I want to set the stage. There's a couple things you need to know before somebody on the internet says anything negative about China. So let's talk about myself, all right? I wanna tell you why I'm so interested, why I do this segment called What's Up Beijing, why I think it's important to talk about. So I am a millennial, AKA a Twitch boomer. <laughs> that means I was born in the 1990s. This is me. I think I was scheming about opening a Pokemon card drop shipping company or something particularly Giga Chat in this photo. I was obviously starting a business of some sort. And when I was born in the 1990s, China had a smaller GDP than Canada. <laughs> in the subsequent 20 or so years, you know, between the mid 90s and now, basically my entire life, all right, going to school, going to college, getting a job, every single year of my life as I grew up, China grew immensely at a rate pretty much unheard of in human history. Until today, they are now the second largest economy in the world, knocking on the door of first. 500 million people during this rapid growth were pulled out of poverty, which is, again, unprecedented in human history. Whatever you think of the government, this is overall generally an incredible thing. And so this relatively little economy became a very big and powerful one. As this happened, though, tensions started to rise, as what happens when there's one dominant power than a rising power, tensions started to rise. And people around the world, as jobs went from factories in other countries to China, they started to get a little bit spooked. And so they created something that I started to notice. This is my guide to writing a headline about China news <laughs> outside of China. In China, everything's controlled by state media. You just write something positive. But outside of China, you follow this guide. Here's my guide to writing about China. If it is bad news, you write China struggles blank, AKA China struggles to tackle population decline. China struggles to reassure wary businesses. China struggles with heat, flooding, and drought. China struggles with hospice care. China struggles with desertification. It's a very easy system. You just write China struggles, no matter if it's like a small thing in China or in one city or isolated or local or one person, China as a whole struggles blank. It's great. The harder part is if there's good news and I've cracked this case as well. If you need to write a headline about China having any good news, you put blank at what cost? China's getting smarter, but at what cost? Wuhan has no more COVID cases, but at what cost? Serbia has rolled out the red carpet to China, but at what cost? Green transition in China? At what cost? China invests in Ethiopia, but at what cost? China's big cities get cleaner air. <laughs> How could that be? But at what cost? China's curing cancer faster and cheaper than anywhere else, but some worry they may be going too fast. <laughs> and on YouTube, where I work, this trend is so much worse. <laughs> Anytime something even remotely bad happens in China, all of the thumbnails come out that say they are completely about to collapse. Andre Jeek here said in 25 days, China's economy will collapse. That was a year ago. <laughs> Graham Stephan said it's over. China's entire economy is about to collapse. He was generous and he gave them 29 days back in August 10th of 2022. <laughs> I was telling you all this to let you know that I am distinctly aware. I am 100% aware of the incentive to hype things up. I'm aware of the incentive to mislead or whatever or in, in a Chinese discussion on economics. And I'm telling you all this to tell you I'm aware of all that. And yet I am still breaking out the Xi Jinping laser eyes. <laughs> I want you to know I would not break these out for nothing. I wouldn't use the laser eyes unless I truly meant it. This week has been disastrous for China. <laughs> I wouldn't use this. I wouldn't use the down arrow over Xi Jinping's eyes thumbnail. We are in a serious situation. This past week, which you could call China turmoil week based on all of the, I mean, it's been a fire hose of bad news. Two main things are at the heart of it. I'm trying to explain it simply. And that is real estate and debt. <laughs> Real estate and debt are really playing a major role in what's going on in China right now. China's on edge as fallout from its real estate crisis spreads. China's housing slump is much worse than official data shows. China's debt-fueled housing market is having a meltdown again. Think about 
about Chinese real estate is it's a $52 trillion bubble. And that's from data in 2019. So it's even bigger. $52 trillion makes it the single largest asset class of anything in the entire world. <laughs> Chinese real estate may be the world's most important single sector. That is bigger than US treasuries. That is bigger by far than the US housing market. It's incredibly big, incredibly important. It's like a third of China's GDP. If it doesn't keep growing, they are in some serious trouble. Their current asset bubble, it eclipses the US housing bubble in 2008 <laughs> by like double. What does this all mean? Let's like explain it with visuals. All right, you guys have heard of the giant ghost cities in China, empty apartment buildings built on mass that no one's living in. You've heard of the construction that is unfinished on many properties that people have paid for. You've heard of the vast public works projects that were created inefficiently, maybe have no use, like dozens of bridges, bridges to nowhere, things like that. Stadiums that are unfinished. Regions, local governments in China building multiple airports to service a single region. <laughs> this one, for example, opened in 2014, cost $160 million to build and serves three to five flights a day. There's no demand. <laughs> There's like three airports around the corner. You may have even heard of the metro stations built literally in the middle of nowhere. These are train stops that get out to nothing. <laughs> All of this stuff has been built over decades and decades in China. And so far, it has been incredible for providing jobs and propping up the GDP and keeping growth going. But a lot of this stuff, almost all of this stuff, was built using debt, which leads to a lot of, uh, a lot of dangerous issues that are only now starting to bubble up. Debt, 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 debt on top of debt on top of debt has been piling up. But finally, finally, the cracks are starting to show. A few days ago, last week, Country Garden, which is the single largest real estate developer in China, stopped paying its bills, stopped paying interest payments on all the debt that it owes. Now, this happened last year to a much smaller company called Evergrande. Maybe you heard about them. And that already was a problem. But China stepped in, helped manage their decline. They got bankrupt. Country Garden is four times bigger than Evergrande and is facing 200 billion in losses. And they are just one company of many that are starting to pop up with this problem. Immediately after this was announced, after they stopped making the first payment, their stock collapsed. It's now about to be delisted. From the largest property developer in China to bankrupt in like days. <laughs> days it disappeared okay this woman who was the ceo of that company and the largest the richest woman in all of asia lost 28.6 billion dollars of her personal fortune she went from like 30 billion to like 2 billion <laughs> the ripple effects are more dramatic why does this one company's collapse threaten the whole economy let's use a fictional person as an example to help you understand. So I created a guy named Zhang Wei, <laughs> Zhang Wei, that which is the most common name in China. I Googled it. <laughs> he is the John Smith of China and he looks pretty happy. Let's say he's upper middle class China and has been a beneficiary of the 40 years of economic boom. He's doing pretty damn well for himself. He's got a good amount of money from a growing economy. He lives in a, a top city and he's ready to start putting his money to work. So what does he do with all the money he's accumulated. Well, the most common thing to do is to buy a house. So that's what he did. Zhang Wei just bought a house. Congratulations. <laughs> he's a homeowner. Couple things you need to know. In China, 70% of household wealth is stored in real estate. That means people take 70% of their savings and use that for a house, basically. That's the idea. So 70% of this guy's money is now in the house he just bought. Now, unfortunately, in China, 90% of new homes are sold via pre-sale, which means you pay for it before it's even built. So they take the money and they promise you a home and then they start constructing it later on. So he doesn't actually have his home yet. Also, <laughs> the price to income ratio for the cities he's living in is now 14 times his income. Think of how unaffordable housing is in the United States. We are at seven times, seven X. <laughs> that is higher than the San Francisco Bay area. That is incredibly expensive. So he's, he's spending well above his means and putting all of his savings into an expensive house. But the idea is that house is gonna continue to grow in value. So we'll have a retirement plan and he's borrowing to do this. Well, <laughs> let's give him two examples. The worst thing that can happen is this. The northern Chinese metropolis of Tianjin construction has slowed to a quiet crawl. It belongs to Country Garden, China's largest property developer by sales volume before this year. But now it's mired in a debt crisis that's threatening to spill over into the rest of the world's second largest economy. This Country Garden project was stopped after we built the framework. We got a notice from management. They haven't paid us since the spring festival in January. Since According January! Estimate, Country Garden has nearly one million 
million homes to complete. The developer has not publicly acknowledged that any of its projects have halted construction. We're very worried because since we arrived here in May, they've only given us living expenses of some $600 per person. We've not received a cent of other payments. So there's a really good chance your home doesn't even get built. For example, if you use Country Garden, they are likely facing bankruptcy and will not be finishing the home that you already prepaid for. That's bad. They poured their savings into homes that were never built. That's from January. That's before even things got bad. To Tang Chao, the apartment in Northeast China was where he and his wife were going to start a new life together. They put tens of thousands of dollars down for it, but months past its scheduled completion, only a concrete shell with wiring is all that's there. Soon, even their marriage unraveled. They poured all their savings into this and they don't get a house. What these and hundreds of thousands of other Chinese homebuyers couldn't have known was that the decades long real estate boom would come to a sudden halt. Developers are running out of money. Here's a woman saying, we never imagined homes would go unfinished in Shanghai. How would it be possible? She paid 500,000 USD for an apartment in Shanghai that is not being built. Again, prepaid. Some of them put money down, some of them prepaid the whole thing, some of them paid half and are paying a mortgage for a home that is not being constructed. They're still paying the debt that they borrowed from a bank on a house they're never going to get, which is causing a lot of people to decide they're gonna stop paying their mortgage. A lot of people across the country are just saying, hey, I'm not gonna pay for a place that is unfinished or never coming, which makes sense. But they owe the money to the bank, not to the developer. When they stop paying their mortgages, that causes problems at banks. So not only is Country Garden in trouble, but Chinese banks are in trouble. Now let's go back to this guy. So he has 70% of his wealth in his house. Let's assume he's one of the lucky ones whose place is finished. All right, he paid for an already done place. Now he bought at the peak of the market, unfortunately, but he bought it. What is happening to his wealth, his 70% of his wealth in that house? It's all down. We are seeing alarming home price declines in basically every region in China by well over 10%, like 10, 15, 20%. So if you put 70% of your wealth in a house that you think is gonna go up and it drops by a fifth in just in a year <laughs> with you know more gloom to come, that becomes very scary. Suddenly you don't wanna invest in a business. Suddenly you don't wanna start a family. Suddenly you don't feel as secure. This is all bad for the economy. China's property crisis burns as the middle class is stuck with huge loans. They're cutting spending, postponing marriage, and boycotting their mortgage. Most Chinese thought that the housing market was a quote, sure bet, <laughs> that it was a good place to put all of your money you were making as a way to have money for retirement. It was gonna grow in value. And again, America is no stranger to this. We did this in 2007. <laughs> Everybody thought housing was a sure bet. You put your money into it, it'll always go up. Well, it's not going up. That being said, China's problems extend even further than that. On average, Chinese do not invest as much in stock market as a lot of the countries. They're, they're less likely to trust it. But let's say he puts 10% of his money in the Hong Seng, the Hong Kong stock market. That's down too. <laughs> it's into the deepest bear market territory it's been in years, dude. Because of country garden stock collapsing and other stocks feeling shady and spending being low, almost every one of these Chinese stocks is down. So if your money's in the stock market, you're losing it there too. But more of your household wealth is evaporating. And then the last 20% of your money, you probably just put in the bank, right? At least this part is safe, all right? You have savings. You kept some money as savings and you put it in a bank. The problem is in China, a lot of money is not put in commercial banks of which there are very few and are tightly regulated by the government, but they are in shadow banks. <laughs> Now, when you think of shadow banks, you could think of Shadow the Hedgehog stealing the Chaos Emeralds. It actually could count, I guess. Shadow banks are not as shady as the name implies. Basically, a shadow bank is any bank that doesn't take regular deposits, but still does banking activity, like loans, wealth investment vehicles, etc. A lot of them could be shady. For example, payday loans are considered a shadow bank. Lehman Brothers in America was a shadow bank. Bernie Madoff Investment Securities, the largest Ponzi scheme in history, was a shadow bank. And in general, shadow banks were a big part of the crisis of 2007 2008 because they're not regulated very well and they make big loans. They end up needing to get bailed out because they make huge loans without thinking about it. And then eventually the debt piles up unsustainably and then nobody gets their money back and it chokes the economy. That might be happening because as of a few days after Country Garden went kaput, I'm gonna say this wrong, but Zhang Rong, one of the largest shadow banks in China, stopped making their payments. <laughs> and that causes problems because that's that's like upper middle class to wealthy Chinese who have put their money to work in a bank that's promising them 7 to 8% return a year. And now they're not making any money and they're not talking about how they're gonna get their money back. So I looked into it and these shadow banks look a lot like 
Ponzi schemes to me. <laughs> They require a certain minimum investment and they promise seven to nine percent yield, well above regular banks. But how do they earn that higher yield? It looks like they do a thing called a cash pool. A cash pool, as far as I can understand, is a nice way of saying a Ponzi scheme, where they take all the money, they put it in a pool, and they use new entrants to repay old entrants. <laughs> But now that new fundraising is drying up in China, the money is not being returned. That is starting to get really scary. And that is where you're starting to see actual protests. People want their money back. And again, protests are very rare in the capital city of Beijing, given how strictly locked down it is. But that's how upset people are for their inability to get their money back. What was the response of the government when people were angry at shadow banks for not paying their money back? Their answer was to send police to break it up and then send police to people at their homes to tell them to not protest anymore. <laughs> The police started visiting shadow bank protesters at their homes to quash unrest. They got their names, they tracked them down, and they're now telling them to not protest. The state media in China is completely quiet about any trouble at these shadow banks. We go back to our main man here, and we notice everything is going badly for him, okay? His house, down in value. His bank deposits, gone. His stock market money, down in value. This is a tough situation. This guy, in this situation, is not gonna spend the money you need to keep an economy growing. And China is desperately trying to change that. The consumers are understandably, quote, gloomy. <laughs> <laughs> they do not want to spend money. They are desperately holding on to whatever money they have. If you look at the China Consumer Confidence Index, it has been continually falling until March 2023, where they stopped publishing it. <laughs> they just straight up stopped, which implies that the next data point was going to be pretty bad. So what is our guy to do? I guess he could keep all of his money in cash, not invest in anything and keep all of his money in cash. Except at the exact same time, China's currency is experiencing a big devaluation. <laughs> China's currency is at the lowest point it's been since in uh, over 15, 16 years. And you will notice ever since Xi Jinping took office right at the peak, it has basically been trending down. So even if you hold your money in cash, it's worth less and less as time goes by. And all of this could maybe be okay. Maybe it's something you could ride out. Maybe it's a temporarily debt bubble. You could maybe print some money, figure it out, stretch out the debts over a while, and eventually things bounce back. The problem is China doesn't have time because... <laughs> For the first time in six decades, their population has started to fall and it will never go back to where it was. They peaked in 2022. Now every year there are fewer Chinese people, which means if you already have too many houses and too many apartments, next year there's even more too many <laughs> because there's less people. Do you understand? You need a baby boom to make real estate continually go up in value because there's more people demanding fewer houses. If there's less and less people for more and more houses, the prices will continue to crater. And that baby boom is not coming. In fact, fertility rate just dropped to record low last year. It's the lowest of any country with a population over 100 million. They are the absolute lowest. But thankfully, our main man already had a baby. This guy's done his part. That's why his son, Dong Wei Jr., <laughs> is here and he's happy. Look at this guy. This guy's crushing it. He's got a kid. This kid's growing up. This kid went to a top university in China. He is ready to take on the world. The only problem is he is graduating into one of the worst youth unemployment crises in any country in the entire world and certainly in China's history. They have record youth unemployment. The jobs market is getting incredibly tough for new graduates to crack. And the response from Chinese government is don't be so picky. <laughs> don't be so picky about a job. Find something, bro. Whatever the pay, figure it out. Xi Jinping directly is telling them to, quote, eat bitterness. We talked about this, which is basically a metaphor for like endure hardship now for reward later. But when you're asking that of you know, the entire youth of a country, that's tough, <laughs> especially as they're going to be required more and more to take care of an aging population that is massive. By the way, these statistics on youth unemployment seen in pink here have only gotten higher and higher and higher into this year. They hit a record of 21.3% in June. We talked about that on this channel. And then they stopped reporting it. <laughs> that just happened like a week ago. 
They've decided they're not going to report it anymore. 21.3% youth unemployment is like Belarus level. I mean, it's bad for such a big country. That's crazy. You might see a pattern here from all this bad news that I'm saying, which is that China is hiding more and more data from the rest of the world. You know, at first people thought they were massaging the numbers. Now they're just outright hiding them. And I want to talk about why all of this bad news in China is particularly hard for them to get out of. Because again, the economy of the country still has many bright spots, but... <laughs> Ideally, in this situation, you'd want to grow through this problem, ideally with some kind of foreign direct investment. The problem is, I want to give a theory as to why China has been dealing, having these problems extra bad lately. <laughs> and it starts with this man. So I try on this show to take complex economic concepts and find a simple way to say them that maybe will stick in your brain. So I've come up with one. I came up with it... <laughs> I came up with it in bed last night, actually, when I was falling asleep. So I'm going to try and say it in, in, in a few uh, words, all right? Here they are. Here's my theory on why things are getting so much worse recently. Xi Jinping is scaring the hoes. <laughs> if you take away one thing from all of this, Xi Jinping is overall, globally, scaring the hoes. So let's take a flashback here to the 1970s when China first started opening up after Mao. Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, great famine, terrible times for China. There was this guy on the right, Deng Xiaoping. Now, this guy's not a hero. This guy's not, again, whatever. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not overly praising him, but I want to say he's probably the best leader China's ever had. And if you are a citizen of a country, you want a leader like this because he's a pragmatist. He had a famous quote where he said, it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice, which basically meant we're not going to be so ideologically driven like Mao was. We're going to do things that work. Whatever works, we're going to do it. And it worked. Instead of worrying about whether things were like 100% aligned with the ideals, they just opened the economy in certain places. They allowed people to start businesses and shit started to grow. Again, this is the famous picture of Coca-Cola finally reaching China, thanks to Deng Xiaoping. And they started to see incredible growth and incredible foreign direct investment. Other countries were investing in China. They were putting their money into China, seeing the potential. He also said, observe calmly, secure our position, cope with affairs calmly, hide our capacities and bide our time, maintain a low profile. His plan was for China to get very rich in silence to not piss anybody off and just get stronger and stronger and stronger. And it was an excellent plan. For Chinese citizens, this was crushing. The country was growing and growing and nobody even really noticed. They were growing and growing and growing and getting bigger and more powerful and nobody noticed. And then right around the time GTA 5 came out, this Chad took power. <laughs> then Xi Jinping said the shirt's coming off, dude. Everybody needs to know he has been in power for the exact length of one GTA 5 game and he has changed everything. Suddenly, the quiet part <laughs> was out the window and he wanted everybody to know not just how great China was, but how great he was. A huge part of Xi Jinping's rule has been enforcing how great he is particularly. <laughs> they have literally Xi Jinping thought school for kids as young as 10 <laughs> that some parents are labeling disgusting. I mean, it's like a personality cult. You have to learn his exact writings in school. He's taught to be amazing and infallible. All the things that feel more like a, a North Korea style country and not the world's second largest economy. And he has been incredibly repress repressive in cracking down on any dissent and any bad news out of China. This article was great. When tragedy strikes in China, the government cracks down on grief. For example, when a roof caved in in a gymnasium where a coach and 10 middle school girls died, the government never released their names and deleted social media posts sharing their names and tributes. <laughs> Any bad news is hidden. The Great Firewall has never been more oppressive than under Xi Jinping's regime. Dozens or hundreds died in severe flooding last week. All of that has completely been censored. Even if it works within China, it has a chilling effect on how the rest of the world sees China. As recently as like eight hours ago, there was this news story of a man who fled China by jet ski all the way to South Korea. This happened eight hours ago. <laughs> I wanted to include it because it was funny. This guy jet skied out of China over to Korea to escape. What was his crime? What was he jailed for that he was then escaping and trying to get out of? It turns out his only crime was he wore this shirt <laughs> called uh, Hitler. <laughs> Comparing G to Hitler. He served an 18-month prison sentence for this shirt. <laughs> and now has to flee the country. I don't think Xi Jinping is Hitler, but I do think you should be allowed to wear whatever fucking shirt you want. And I can go on Amazon right now and buy a fuck Biden flag. <laughs>
This is the most popular retailer in the country. And it's like a top seller. On the other hand, China's version of Amazon, Alibaba, which was for a time their crown jewel company. One of the best tech companies in China, rapidly growing, huge valuation. As you guys may know, the CEO Jack Ma went missing for two months. <laughs> when he disagreed with the Chinese government. He just went, I mean, he's back, obviously. They didn't, they didn't kill him or anything, but he went missing. He was like made to hide. And that caused an extremely chilling effect on the Alibaba stock. The stock has tumbled from 317 to 76, like a third of its value. And this is one of the biggest tech companies in China. China's business leaders are saying the country that let them thrive is slipping away, largely due to this cult of personality and crackdown by Xi Jinping. There's no place for the innovation they, they ran with for 30 years in a system dominated by one ruler. And China's business elite aren't the only ones that see it that way. You see, foreign direct investment, we talked about this, this is what money flowing into China, is at the lowest it's been since 1998. <laughs> people are pulling money out of the country. I mean, people are uh, literally afraid to invest in anything in China because they don't know if it can get cracked down on by Xi Jinping. If you look at like how China is thought of, like what, what, is, what is the perception of China in other countries? In the United States, it is literally the lowest it's ever been. People in the United States have never been more unfavorable on China in the history of the country, which is pretty crazy. And then in the rest of the world, it's historically high as well. Pretty much everyone has been turned off. They've been scared by Xi Jinping's attitude uh, and, and way he's running the country. And that is reflecting in exports. So this is the change in exports, year over year change in exports from China and every country. You'll notice 80% up in Russia, down in every other country. <laughs> Every single other country is importing less stuff from China, except for Russia. Russia's obviously getting more because they have no other trading partners. That is not what you want as you're already going into an economic slowdown. You want this stuff to be up. It's very important that your trade is doing well when your real estate market's collapsing. Additionally, despite being the dominant economic power in Asia, they don't have a ton of friends around them. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, India are all either foes or frenemies at best. They're surrounded on all sides by neighbors that are not as friendly as they'd like to be given their ability to be their dominant trading partner. Oh, by the way, a few days ago, Japan, Korea, and the United States signed a trilateral partnership for defense. Japan and Korea are right on China's borders. They should be close friends with China's. Instead, they're signing deals with Biden. So what is China's plan? Plan. What, is, what is their plan for all of this? Step one is BRICS. <laughs> Not these BRICS, this BRICS. The group of five nations in uh, mostly the global south, all up and coming. Russia, India, South Africa, China, Brazil. This is AI generated, by the way. And BRICS, if you don't know, in 1995 was a small share of the global economy, these five countries. But now these five countries are bigger than the G7. BRICS is a very dominant force in the world. <laughs> these countries are more and more powerful. And they're having a meeting right now. Like as we speak, there is a, there's a meeting in South Africa of all the nations of BRICS to talk about the future. And China is urging BRICS to become a geopolitical rival to the G7. They basically wanna become closer with these five countries and be a real threat to the G7 countries. Xi Jinping, as you can see here, a few days ago, landing in South Africa to fanfare. <laughs> The problem is it doesn't really look like this in reality. This is <laughs> this is a fiction. In reality, Vladimir Putin can't even attend because he's wanted for international war crimes. <laughs> so he had to teleconference in. <laughs> Xi Jinping, despite being scheduled to speak, decided not to at the last second. I don't know why. And so had a deputy speak for him. I actually don't know why. I'm, I'm interested in understanding more. Their calls for accelerated BRICS expansion were kind of shot down, but the idea was to add a bunch more countries to BRICS, which they may do, but a lot of roadblocks were put up today by India and Brazil, who have both been trying to get a little bit cozier with the West lately. Specifically, Biden called Lula last week. <laughs> they were talking. They were talking before this event. Next week, Biden's flying to India to meet with uh, with Modi. In July, Modi and Biden raised a toast to everlasting friendship. <laughs> so clearly, at the very least, India, which is by far the most important member of BRICS other than China, like China really needs India more than anyone else. India is the bell of the ball right now, dude. India is playing both sides and coming out on top. Everybody wants to be friends with India. And US and India have signed a defense and tech deal this year. So clearly they are not trying to be part of an alliance against the G7. They actually spoke out against it. Joe Biden said, 
India is the most important country in the world to him. <laughs> Obviously, I'm assuming other than the United States, <laughs> which he's the president of. But clearly, this is important. So the BRICS plan, if it does play out, will take a lot longer and be more unsteady than I think China needs. So what is going to happen? Is China going to collapse in 29 days? The answer is no. No. Hell no. <laughs> There's no shot. Okay, there's still a very powerful economy. There are still many good things going on in China. Specifically, despite blockades, they're creating many more homegrown chips, tasty, tasty microchips. <laughs> and electric vehicles, China is dominating the market. China is becoming the number one car exporter in the world. They just passed Germany and are on track to pass Japan. Electric vehicles are the future and China controls the market. They're doing incredibly well. There's plenty of good things. But the real estate bust is going to have serious and significant impacts. If you guys know, in the 1990s, when Japan had their real estate bust, they had two decades of lost growth, of flat growth. Two lost decades, coming up on three, really. China's real estate bubble is much bigger than that, and they aren't already rich the way Japan was. They are facing some seriously tough years ahead. And when you think about it, a country that has extremely high youth unemployment, a bunch of young, mostly male men that can't find a job and aren't optimistic about the future, mostly male men, I'm sorry, a mostly male young populace, has often in history led to military action. Either those people get mad at the government or the government sends them to get mad at somebody else. I don't know. Is China preparing for war? We could ask Xi Jinping, who says, yes, they are. <laughs> and maybe the world should take him seriously. We may never know. What I wanna say, I don't think this is gonna resolve easily and peacefully like last year's Evergrande crisis. This feels much bigger, and it feels mostly like the end of 40 years of easy growth into a much more turbulent time in China ahead. And if you wanna know more about that, then keep watching What's Up Beijing <laughs> every week here on Marketing Monday. Thank you for watching, and thank you for the update on this week in China.